Hi folks, welcome to Bear Mountain today. Thought we would do a question and answer on anemones. It's been about four years since we've done that. And so we thought we'd talk today just about some of the things that we're doing now and maybe some of the things that have changed over the last four years. And so let's take a walk through a list of questions. So I thought I'd start today first with the anemones and go over some of the common questions that, that occur. Some of these were answered in past videos, but they're you kind of got to maybe hunt for all the answers in one place. So I thought maybe we'd just go over some of the more common questions. One of the number one things that people ask about our anemones is why do you raise them in crates and not in the ground? This is kind of a legacy system in a sense. Um, years ago when we first started, we raised... Uh, a lot of lilies uh, that were planted usually from uh, March, February, March, all the way through the end of July. And this was a system that we were planting the lilies. Um, they would come in not all at once, but we'd be planting so much per week or every two weeks. And this left a lot of open space where by the end of summer, we would have most all these crates in here in lilies. And so we needed a crop that we could raise that would uh, carry us through to April and give us something that would bloom earlier than lilies. Because lilies, for the most part, even when we were starting to plant them in February, wouldn't bloom until uh, late May or early June. We'd get our first blooms off of them. And anemones were a great choice. And so we adapted the crate system um, that we're using from lilies into the anemones and it seemed to work pretty good. And at that time we were members of the ASCFG and there were others uh, back in the East Coast that were kind of doing the same thing and, and that's where we got a lot of our, our beginning information on what to do and how to do it. So some of the questions that people ask in crates are, well, how many do you put in a crate? Well, when we first started doing it, we actually packed them pretty good. We put about 21 in a crate, so it'd be three rows of seven, kind of equally, as equally spaced as you could make them, but it filled the crate pretty good. And over the years, we've been kind of winnowing that back because what we've noticed, at least in our climate, and since we don't have um, an air circulation fan in this unheated hoop house system that we use, uh, we were getting a lot of uh, excess humidity problems that resulted in fungus diseases and, and in some cases um, just the plants were just getting too crowded and too floppy. We were getting a, a, just we were just getting too many problems. So we've been scaling it back uh, and, and now we plant uh, approximately 15 in a crate and that gives it more space and the plants could actually get a little bigger as time goes and they seem to produce pretty well. We still get some fungal diseases toward the end of the season, but um, we also are able to maintain uh, things. Uh, we do get some weed problems in our crates and we'll talk about that here in a second too. But it seemed to give us in general a better plant. So we're using 15 per crate now and it doesn't matter what the variety is, whether it's a Galilee or a Carmel or whatever series. Um, it doesn't matter. And so that's um, kind of what we're doing. Now, the types of corms of what we're doing is um, we don't plant the corms uns unsprouted. Uh, we tried that once and we didn't get a good result. And I think part of the reason was is it takes longer for the unsprouted corm to uh, germinate. And at this time of year, uh, with these crates not having the warmth of ground soil behind them, the plants were more susceptible at that corm stage to, to freezing damage. And last and the year we did it, we, we had some freezing damage and we lost actually quite a few of them and had to replant. So we've gone back to uh, soaking the corms. And, and one of the things uh, about soaking the corms and pre-sprouting them is when you soak the corm, your objective is to just get it plumped up, okay? It's not like there's a set recipe that says, oh, take the corm, put it in water, and leave it there for a day. Um, no. 
these are living things and you know that are not used to being flooded um, but at the same time they're in dormancy when you get them they're they're dry and they're dormant and that stage needs to be broken and it's broken really simply by soaking them uh, we use an air bubbler and it's just kind of an idea of watching them size smaller corms seem to plump up faster than the the bigger corms so if you got five sixes five sevens it may take three to four hours um, but most of the time with the smaller corms um, we can see that they're plumped and hydrated enough in probably two to three hours so that's kind of where we're at right now with this and that just so the whole objective when you're doing that is you're just trying to get them to the point where you're you got hydration in them and how then, long did you um, soak these ones this year uh, these were mostly smaller corms and it, it was about two and a half hours tops you know and what I did is I came back in and I checked it kind of regularly about every half hour 45 minutes or so just to kind of you know, move them around in the bucket take a look at them see if they were getting plumped up um, and what we have found is uh, the losses go way down when you do that I and mean, you can soak a corm for a long time, pull it out and say, well, it looks great. You know, it's all big and fluffy and, and firm, but basically it may be damaged from a lack of oxygen or, or just from the fact that um, the longer it sits in, in a, you know, in that state, even if you've got a bubbler in there, the oxygen level is not as good as it is in the soil or in, you know, just regular potting mix. So that, I think is an important point. So lots of people we've seen and observed have maybe gone too far on that end and, and they get some bad results. It doesn't mean that you're going to kill them all, but it may mean that you may have more fungal diseases as these things grow out than you anticipated. And that's what we observed. There are people who don't soak um, and they plant in the ground, maybe like in a hoop house and um, it's a well insulated hoop house or or the soil itself will stay warmer longer and um, or they're in a temperate climate it doesn't freeze super bad and they're okay and it, it works out just fine because you got to remember these things you know their parent evolved in nature someplace so they weren't you know babied along for the most part so there is there is a, a methodology to these things, um, waiting for the soil to get adequate moisture, for the, for the corm to get rehydrated, and then the temperatures and the day lengths are just right, and then it begins to grow. So that's kind of the, the process on it. So it's not absolutely you got to soak them. The only reason we do it is, is because our next step in pre-sprouting is, is we put them in trays. Um, we don't put them in individual cells. We just put them in a general 10 by 20 weave bottom tray. Um, we put maybe a half inch, three quarter inch in the bottom of potting mix. And then we'll put the corms in and just kind of spread them out as evenly as possible. And then fill up to the top of the tray with potting mix. Make sure it's well moistened potting mix, not dry. Not wet. Not wet. Just just it'd be like a 70 60 60 70 percent moisture if you squeezed it in your hand you might get a drop out that's what you need that's where you eat. so there'll be plenty of oxygen in there but enough moisture to keep the system moving we did a video on that part of the um pre-sprout the actual getting them to root is there any changes from our previous video that you're doing different this year the only difference is, is we are using some KNF uh, solutions to help um, just kind of get it inoculated and give it a little boost. We put some FPJ in the soaking mix and uh, as well as some uh, oriental herbal nutrient, which is, um, you know, typically made from extracts of garlic and cinnamon and a couple of others. There's like six different herbs in it. And that's kind of an antipathenogenic. Whereas the FPJ is kind of a biostimulant. What is the FPJ? That stands for uh, fermented plant juice. And what that is, is we're taking, in our case, we're using comfrey. We take the growth tips of comfrey and we use osmotic extraction with brown sugar to remove all kinds of growth hormones and things like that. So it encourages the growth of our anemone. That's, that's the idea. It's, it's just basically like a biostimulant to kind of give the thing a little boost. And... Uh, what we have noticed is it has helped in 
general with um, the plants sprouting faster? Germination was better, yes. but was extremely faster. Yes, uh, these things were ready to plant in approximately five days from the point that we did the soak and we did put them in the pre-sprout trays. And the past? In the past, uh, it's usually been seven to ten days when they were ready to go, so... Most likely, most typically towards ten. Yeah, it, so let's just say for argument's sake we got a 30 to 40 percent reduction in time necessary and then they were ready to go to put in the crates. Now our crate system, we're not a change that we made is we used to dump the crates and put in fresh potting mix. We'd actually buy potting mix and um, put in, you know, maybe some minerals and things of that nature to kind of give it a little boost. But basically it was purchased potting mix and it was used for a season and then dumped on the, out, out in the fields and just kind of, you know, left to, to go into the ground. We've made this now into um, a, a semi-permanent type thing where we're replenishing the soil that's not potting mix, it's real soil in these crates. And uh, we're using our own compost, which unfortunately this year what we noticed is it has uh, had a, quite a few weed seeds in it. And so uh, we're going to have to do some uh, early weeding in here. But in general, uh, the compost was um, really pretty good. And what we have noticed is, is, is these crates are going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 50, 40 to 50% uh, compost organic matter and the rest of it, 60% or so, is just regular soil. Now you may say, well, how do you keep the soil? This is another question that comes up. How do you keep the soil from falling out of the crates? When we initially made the crates, what we did is we just lined newspaper in the bottom and then just put the soil in it. The newspaper will rot away and, you know, ultimately in the end, it'll just be the soil against the actual uh, air, air holes in the crate itself. And, uh, but what we found with the increased organic matter is um, as that has increased in the crates, um, the actual amount of material falling out of the bottom of the crates is, is significantly less. Okay, just going to walk you through quickly what we did then. As we talked about earlier, we plant 15 in a crate. And what you're seeing in here is these corms were planted on the in the crate on the 15th of October. And today we are at the 5th of November. So we're looking at about three weeks right here is what they look like. They sprouted and they're getting up to this point. Um, some of them, I guess just by variety, are a little slower than others. But in general, probably by the middle of December, this is going to be a nice, thick... Um, green, you know, the plants will be in pretty good shape. So somebody may, may ask, well, what other fertilization do you use? Okay, we do not use any fertilization anymore. We stop using stuff like feather meal or fish meal or cottonseed meal or anything of that nature. And here's the reason why. These bulbs are, if you think about it, are early spring bulbs. In their own nature, what they're looking to do is to grow in the cool season. And typically, in order to make nitrogen available for a plant, um, when you're using a feather meal as an example, that's protein. And protein uh, with biologic activity will develop into a nitrate or nitrite. I'm not sure which one or the other, but anyway, plant available nitrogen to the plant. These guys have evolved over the eons to use very low nitrogen because in a normal cool spring area like where your soil temperatures are 40 degrees and these guys will grow fine, the biologic activity for nitrogen fixation and things of that nature is kind of low. So these guys have evolved to grow well on a low nitrogen type of environment. Um, the only thing they really maybe do, we, we do is we give them an extra boost of uh, minerals using uh, fermented seawater uh, and as they get to bloom stage we'll use KNF solutions that include uh, water soluble calcium phosphate. The whole idea is we want a plant that's well balanced. Um, one of the things that we noticed and we made a mistake about three years ago is we used cottonseed meal Bad. and we got 
beautiful, lush, you know, nice, big anemone plants. And just as they got to the point to blooming, two things started to happen. The stems corkscrewed and became very weak and floppy, and then aphids moved in. And no matter how well we ventilated to try to cool things down to make it inhospitable for the aphids, they went after these plants with a vengeance. It was bad. But what we noticed is that was the first year I used water-soluble calcium phosphate. Sprayed it on, you know, you mix like four, mil four milliliters per gallon of water. Sprayed it on these guys, and within three weeks, pretty much the entire aphid problem was gone. But we lost a lot of blooms. We lost a lot of blooms during hard that Hard lesson. It was a hard lesson. And so now what we've done is it's just part of the routine. As these guys go through their vegetative stage and start to get to the bloom stage, the reproductive stage, that's when we start applying water-soluble calcium, calcium phosphate. And don't foliar feed nitrogen or anything of that nature because they don't need it. Another thing that quite often happens that we also figured out how to fix is split stems. Yeah, that, that was another uh, issue too. Um, if you water too much, you've got to watch that. Calcium seemed and to fix And the calcium would also fix it. The calcium made a stronger stem. So they didn't split. Right. Do we, save the, do we save the corms? You know, we have off and on, and the success rate has varied all over the place. Sometimes by different varieties are better than others, but most of the time what we have noticed is, um, until last year, um, when we started using the K and F stuff more, what we noticed was there was a lot of rot in the um, towards the end of the season when the corms would be going into dormancy. A lot of fungus that would show then when you went through the pre-sprout and you and you try to get them ready for plant. That's when you'd notice that they just fail. About fifty percent. Fifty percent. Sometimes some varieties like caramel white, we had a lot of trouble with that one, and uh, that one that one had a high fail rate. Um, so and, we cover our butt. <laughs> so we we buy new um, most every year, and we buy enough to get us through the season. And anything that we did dig out and save, um, we just use it for a field planting. So or we'll plant, fill in. Or if fill something in if is to, yeah. if something has been you know eaten by rodents or something like that, we we fill in with follow up corms, but. Most of them go into the field. Right. And when we say field, we'll plant those in like um, late January. Um, first of February. First of February, right in there. And so they will bloom in, we'll get most of the blooms of those guys in May, which when that by that time the hoop house is finished. So it it's too good. hot. Yeah. Um, one of the things another people ask is, okay, um, how do you protect or do you need to protect? Well, Actually, anemones are pretty resilient to cold uh, once they get up to this vegetative stage. Uh, what we did notice was when, when they were just at the germination stage and the growth tip is probably very um, sensitive to low freezing temperatures and that can kill it and cause rot. Um, but when it gets to this stage and maybe a little bigger, um, we do protect if we have temperatures that are going down below 25 28 to 25 we'll put over these hoops like right here and we've got hoops behind me we'll drape agarbon 50 fabric cloth over it those are just poly tubing yeah that's just black utility grade irrigation pipe that again, it doesn't take any weight and you can buy it at home depot or someplace like that a roll of 100 feet of it for like 20 very bucks. cheap yeah it's like three quarter inch and it's just cut to whatever size you need to do it in this case i think they're like i don't know eight foot sections or something like that and then we mounted it on a fiberglass rod so we can move it up or down um just and to... we created little clips mm -hmm. by yeah. just cutting some of the tube in little sections in half and it just clips the frost blanket in place right and so what we'll do is, is this also enables us in the morning to come back out and pull it up real quickly to the center of the hoops. And meanwhile, it, you know, everything is protected overnight and then it's okay during the day. Because one of the things you don't want to do is you don't want to get these guys hot. We want to keep things cool. 
So even in the middle of winter, we will have this hoop house vented. We've actually uh, even kept the house vented during a snowstorm uh, because it wasn't particularly cold and we wanted to keep the humidity level as even as we could. <laughs> um, so frost protection, yeah. And we've even noticed ones outside could take <laughs> pretty close to almost zero and <laughs> still live. It was bizarre. They didn't look that great, but they, they did live. Uh, so these guys are pretty tough, whereas opposed to ranunculus are just, they're wusses. They get below they're, 28, they just, you they're know. Babies. <laughs> no, they're babies. They're wusses. <laughs> um, rodents, do we get rodents? Yeah, we do. Bulls climb, they can climb. Um, the biggest thing that we've got going for us right now is we have seven, no, eight cats. Eight cats. That, um, they're all out around hunting around all the time. They actually sleep in here. Yeah, we got one or two that sleep in here. They don't seem to bother the crates at all. At all. So um, I guess we're blessed with that. They're busy with other stuff. And, but um, they do a good job. They do a good job in the hoop houses and in here. Uh, so that's been a blessing. If we do get a problem in the crates, and we have found that, um, we'll use snap traps and to try to get rid of them. And that's usually pretty effective. But sometimes the damage is the damage, you know, once it's done. Uh, irrigation. How do we irrigate? We use drip tape. Um, each of these crates um, has three strips of drip tape that as emitters are half gallon per hour at four inch spacing. And the reason we use four inch is we want to make sure that we have a number of emitters in each crate uh, that it stays pretty constant. When we irrigate, we turn it on for tops 15 minutes. It's just good enough to get it where you start to see it maybe starting to drip out the bottom and then turn it off. And in the winter time, as the light levels are low, irrigation becomes less and less. Um, right now, being in November, um, this, yesterday was the first time I irrigated in here uh, since planting time. So that was almost three weeks. And so you're replacing them by those rolls over there. We're yeah. replacing them. How long did the tape that was in here originally last? Uh, we were able to keep it flushed and, you know, with good filters on it. We were able to use it for four years. So that's what was really the worst problem? Me. The worst problem was, was my wife cutting them and I having to splice them together. <laughs> I just wanted long stems and, and I kept I'd find nipping it when them. I turned the irrigation on when it just go. <laughs> I was careful, but still, he had that problem. <laughs> so that that's about it. I'm not sure were there any other questions that you remember that folks had on anemones. No, they just wanted to know: um, Do we save them? Um, uh, what were we doing different than we have in the past? We're applying the K and F, right? Yeah. But we aren't saying that this has fixed everything. No. It just seems to be. You always have to put things in the context. You have to observe your own situation. That's this is what works here. Now I can't say that that would be the same set of problems or the same set of circumstances for say somebody who's in the high country in Arizona. You know, like where they get really, really cold winters, but really weird, like really, really cold at night and pretty warm during the day. That may create a whole different set of things. We typically go low light because we have a lot of cloud cover. We're 60 miles from the coast. Low light um, and moderate temperatures for most of the time. Most of the winter, we're in the high 30s, mid 30s. To mid 40s at night most of the time 45 to 50 during the day in the winter time that's kind of where it st sits because a lot of the time what we're doing is we're just getting a lot of rain and that's mostly why they're in a tunnel is just to keep the rain off of yeah them. folks ask what zone we are well technically we're in usda zone 8b however <clears throat> um I don't know what that means anymore. <laughs> yeah, it just seems to be changing all the time. But the other thing is that we have two rows of these um, crates, but we're actually growing a little less mm -hmm. than in the past. So some of the things that we have growing in the back, 
will do a follow-up video, but they include things like muscari, ornithogallums, freesia, and uh, pansies. Pansies. And then the very back is, we built this. This was a kit from um, Farmer's Friend. LLC, Farmer's yeah. Friend. And we built it the full length to be able to use the back end for overflow of um, seedlings. So, yeah to grow on the pandemic's kind of changed a lot yeah. of things and so you know businesses for business for us because this is just the situation we are in uh, different people are in different places but where we are in um we we've had to do a lot more uh shelter in place um because of health issues and that changed a lot of dynamics on a lot of things and we'll just see how that washes out next year but in a general sense um Things are a little bit, a lot, lot smaller for us than, than they have been. So. But, you know, maybe light, uh, less anemone corms will mean bigger blooms. Well, hello, Mr. Webb. Well, one of our resident vole hunters just entered the picture. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that kind of pretty much wraps up uh, the questions that we get a lot that are pretty common. Now, if you have more desire to learn more about the KNF stuff or maybe uh, go back and look at some of the earlier things that we might have done on anemones the and, pre -sprout. And, and the pre-sprout um, we have videos on that and be sure they're under playlists or you can just do a search um, you know and on anemones and you should get a title of all the anemones that videos that we've done on it and you can find out more information there we've done a lot of stuff on this over the past so some of the things change as we learn things so you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt. If some things you find in there work for you, great. Anyway, thank you guys for watching today. Appreciate everything. And you guys stay safe and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.